When you're making a spicy fried chicken sandwich at home, you need to make a lot of decisions. You need to pick your chicken, buns, sauces, your toppings, condiments, and so many more. Some ingredients can make your chicken juicy, crispy, and delicious, while others can make it dry, pallid, or soggy. My name is Andrew Ray, AKA Babish, and this is every decision I make in whipping up my ultimate spicy fried chicken sandwich. When I'm taking my first bite of a spicy fried chicken sandwich, I want it to be crispy first and foremost, then juicy, then flavorful, in that order. If you want the ultimate fried chicken sandwich experience, you need to be intentional in picking each step of the process. Starting with arguably the most important step, chicken. Even though these are all chicken, they're gonna yield a different product with a different moisture content, fat content, texture, flavor, and overall quality. There are some objectively right and wrong answers on this table. Let's start with the wrongest answer, bone-in, skin-on chicken thighs. These would make for great fried chicken, but I'm not sure if you've ever tried to eat a sandwich with a bone in it. It's not gonna go your way. Very typical to leave skin on when making fried chicken, but in a sandwich situation, you might just pull the whole thing out and embarrass yourself in front of your entire church. Next wrongest option are these guys. These are processed. They might be made from white meat, but it's all chopped up and formed into a patty. This is not one piece of breast. This tastes exactly like the entirety of a high school cafeteria. The furniture, the milk. So it's kind of nostalgic in that way, it's kind of fun, but pretty gross otherwise. Now on to chicken breast tenders. It's this sort of little channel of meat that runs barely connected to the rest of the breast. So this could be a good solution if you stacked three of these together. And if you stack some mozzarella sticks in there for like extra credit, you get an A in my class. I'm not gonna go with that because I think it might not be the best option. Chicken breast versus chicken thigh. Perfectly viable options for a fried chicken sandwich. What you're gonna get over here with the chicken thigh is you're gonna get a really moist, more chicken flavor forward patty. This is a great option. Next up, the breast. This has no fat content, virtually no flavor content. If you overcook this by a whisper, it's gonna cook up really, really dry. That being said, deep frying is an ideal environment to cook chicken breast because it's getting cooked quickly and at not too crazy a temperature. If you just drop this straight in the oil, it'd be terrible. With the breading, it's got this shell around it that's going to keep it from getting stringy and dry and you're gonna end up with a moist, juicy piece of chicken. I think this is what I'm gonna go with today. Before we turn these into a sandwich, we have to address their thickness. These are already pretty thin breasts, so all we really need to do with them, I think, is pound them out. That is both to tenderize them, to even out their thickness so that they cook evenly, and uh, those two things. So this is the chicken I'm gonna be using for my spicy fried chicken sandwich. But before I can bread and cook it, I have to brine it. Brining accomplishes three main things. Helps the chicken stay moist, it imbues it with flavor, and it tenderizes it. So I'm gonna make a brine. The base of my brine is buttermilk. First off, it has a pleasant tang, and it has enzymes in it that are gonna break down some of the proteins or something in the chicken and help make it more tender. Pickle brine, how good does that sound? Fried chicken with pickle flavor in it, like that's awesome. The only thing you wanna make sure that you got right is your salinity. You wanna make sure there's a good amount of salt, not too much, not too little, but I'm still kind of eyeball it, so whatever. Uh, <laughs> then I've got a little dash of hot sauce here. Cayenne pepper is borderline flavorless, but it's extraordinarily spicy because this brine is going to go on to be the liquid element of our breading. I want to throw an egg in there. This just adds structure. So now chicken goes in here. I wouldn't go less than like four hours on this. One day I think is ideal, overnight ideal. So here's my chicken that's brining for my chicken sandwich. Now, an essential element of any fried chicken sandwich is the breading. We're breading because we obviously want our chicken sandwich to be crispy. If I ordered a fried chicken sandwich, there were no breading on it, I would be, to say the least, confused and say the most, offended. We have lots of different options. Let's roll through them. We have plain breadcrumbs. It's a very, very fine grained breadcrumb. This will work in a pinch. It's, you know, it's bread and you're frying it. That's delicious. It's gonna be fine, but it's not bringing enough personality to the party. And I don't think it's gonna make our chicken crispy enough. Next up, we have panko. This is a strong contender. Panko is a lighter, airier, Japanese-style breadcrumb. It's going to create a wonderfully crisp crust, but let's keep going. We have good old-fashioned flour. This is the classic way to go to make 
fried chicken, particularly Nashville hot chicken. So this is a tempting option. Next up, we have Flaming Hot Cheetos, which we contractually have to do because it's the internet. But the cameras are horizontal. We're not making TikToks here, so I'm not gonna make a freaking Flaming Hot Cheeto breaded mozzarella stick, whatever. Fest. Then we have seasoned breadcrumbs. These are the same as the ones over there yonder, but they have usually Italian seasonings in them. Not only is it the same texture as the plain unseasoned breadcrumbs over here, but these spices, they're gonna be directly exposed to the heat, which is gonna burn them. And they also have a flavor profile that I'm not going for in this sandwich. Then we got cornflakes, which is a very fun option. Hell, they even have a picture of fried chicken on the back of the box. So this is a great way to add bigger flakes of crunch. If I'm going to use this, I'm gonna crunch it up like that so that it's more of an element of the breading rather than these big old honking flakes sticking out. We have one more option to consider and that is batter. And that's a very tempting option, but it's not crunchy. It's crispy. It's not as crunchy. So here's what I'm thinking. My favorite spicy fried chicken is Nashville style. I don't think I can use panko as much as I really truly want to. I'm sure I would incur the wrath of the entire state of Tennessee. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do a flour breading and I'm going to crush up some cornflakes in there for a little added crunch. So let's do that. We have this lovely combination of milk and eggs right here that the chicken has bean brining in. And just to add a little bit of crunch, I'm going to supplement my flour with some crunched up cornflakes. So I'm just gonna season it with salt and pepper, layer flavors, always a good idea. The other thing that we're gonna do to make sure that the crust of our chicken is craggly and filled with nooks and crannies of crispy delights, stir a bit of our liquid right into the batter. This is going to create flakes of breading that are going to give us a crispier, more robust crust. Now, straight into the flour. We're really well coated there, but we're not done. We're gonna double bread these suckers. So by doubling it up, we're doubling the crisp. Look, look, look at how like textured this is. That's gonna fry up super crispy. That's what I like to see, this sort of wrinkled, craggled surface. That is going to translate to an epic crust. There we go. This is my marinated and breaded chicken. Next up, we have to choose our buns. I want it to be dense and kind of toothsome. I really like, you know, a kind of a chewy, something not too flavorful, definitely not crumbly or dry. Waffles are, are an interesting pick, but uh, these don't age terribly well. After you've made the fresh, hot, crisp waffle, it turns into something a little bit more floppy and dense and chewy. Biscuits, another novel idea. A primary characteristic of biscuits is crumbliness. These degrade very quickly. These were probably relatively tasty, fresh out of the oven. Now they're kind of bricked. Then we have potato hamburger rolls. I like potato rolls versus just straight up wheat buns because they tend to have like a sort of chewier, more toothsome texture, which is what I want in a sandwich. These guys are totally acceptable, but for the size of the chicken that we're working with, I think a little insubstantial. Normie hamburger buns. These are still pretty chewy, but like not quite. They're, they're, they're very insubstantial. I feel like if they got too much moisture on them, they'd fall apart or they'd compress into nothing. Then last but not least, brioche, which normally I can't stand behind uh, when it comes to burgers especially, but also fried chicken sandwiches. A little more acceptable with fried chicken. With burgers, I just, I'm just not a fan. They're too sweet, they're too rich, however, Hear me out. This is the right size. This is the size I'm going for. I got those big chicken breasts. They're huge. They're gonna contract a little bit when they cook, but they're still gonna be a big old thing. If I try to put those on these, it's gonna look cartoonish. I'll be made a fool of. And we're making this super duper duper spicy. A fatty, sweet roll actually plays pretty nice with it. I think this can stand up to it, especially if we toast it. Normally not my top pick at all, but on this table, this is the move. Next up, we gotta toast our buns. This is an essential step in sandwich and burger craft alike. It helps protect the bun from moisture. It adds flavor, it adds texture. Why isn't there a toaster on this table? I'll tell you why. I don't wanna toast both sides of the bread. I just want the interior toasted. If we toast both sides, that might dry it out. These guys into a heated cast iron pan, nonstick skillet, whatever you wanna use. We got a little smoke going here. Oh, wow, okay, that's perfect. <laughs> this thing runs hot. Let these sit cut side up on your countertop, or if you really wanna prevent them from getting soggy, you can throw them on a rack. And here's the buns, all toasted and ready to go. So now we've picked out our bun, but what's going on that bun? Sausage. 
Our chicken is going to be extremely flavorful. Any sauces that we're gonna add shouldn't be stealing the spotlight. So we need a texture and a flavor that are gonna play nice with the big ones that we got going on. Honey mustard and fried chicken go together like honey mustard and fried chicken. They're a classic and timeless combination that I'm not gonna be exploring in this sandwich. I prefer that more in a chicken fingers scenario. Ranch, it could totally work, but very strong flavors in the opposite direction, which can be a good thing, but I think this is a bridge too far. If it's bottled, it's gonna be a little runny too, so you're gonna have a drippy situation going on here, so I probably wouldn't go with, with ranch. Ketchup. Yeah, I don't think so. I feel like it just classes down the sandwich pretty immediately. Frank's Red Hot, way too thin. If you put this directly on your sandwich, again, you're gonna have a very drippy situation, which some people like, I don't. I would sprinkle this on after the fact if your chicken sandwich was too dry and flavorless. Hopefully, we won't need that. Then on to the question of mayo. I love mayo on a fried chicken sandwich. It's kind of part and parcel with almost every fried chicken sandwich. Mayo is adding fat to the situation, creaminess. Uh, it's, it's just great sort of accompaniment to the crunch and to the spice. Hellman's, totally acceptable. Egg yolks, oil, mustard, and spices. That's what it tastes like. It's solid. The same cannot be said for Sir Kensington's. Oh, oh, oh my God, that's so gross. There's a fishy element to it. There's a, like a basement must going on. This would detract from whatever you put it on. I definitely want mayo on my sandwich, but I think I'm gonna make my own because that's gonna make something head and shoulders above anything you can get at the store. Mayonnaise made from raw eggs. The sort of general rule of thumb that I like to use is to hit the egg with the same amount of force that it would receive if you were to drop it from about here. What is it, about 36 inches? Three feet, roughly? Whop. You lose a little bit, but I got a shell in there. Don't listen to me, I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, when you drop it like that, you're getting a little splatter. If you just hit it with that amount of force, you're gonna get a nice, clean crack. Now we're gonna add half a clove of garlic. The juice of half a lemon, probably gonna do that much. Some sugar. Need a little bit of salt in there. And Dijon mustard. An essential part of this recipe is that you need a blender cup that's this, virtually the same width as the head of the immersion blender. You want there to be very, very little play on the sides of the container. That's how you're gonna create this little vortex in there that emulsifies together the oil and the egg and creates a thick, creamy mayonnaise. So first, we're gonna blitz this a little bit just to liquefy the garlic and beat up the eggs. Perfect and slowly, carefully pour two cups of oil. This is a neutral flavored vegetable, canola. If you overprocess olive oil, it can become bitter. So you don't wanna use olive oil. It's also just too flavorful. And so we're gonna start by processing at the bottom and then we're gonna sort of slowly pulse our way up. Now this is homemade mayonnaise. Mm. It's the only mayonnaise that I would eat on its own like that. <laughs> Here's the mayo I'm using for my fried chicken sandwich. Next up, toppings. Somebody hit a gong? Does a spicy fried chicken sandwich need toppings? Not necessarily. We don't want it to add any sort of slipperiness or structural instability. Anything that we're gonna add should make the sandwich greater than the sum of its parts, not safeguard against its shortcomings. First up we have lettuce. I don't know why we put lettuce on sandwiches. It adds a little pop of color, really not much flavor. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Cabbage, the precursor to slaw. Certainly not gonna put just whole slabs of cabbage on there, we're out of our minds. Shredded and mixed together with a little bit of mayo and some spices, this can be a wonderful accompaniment to a spicy fried chicken sandwich because it's gonna add some tang and sort of cool things off. And that would be nice, but it's, it's kind of overcomplicating things. I'm not sure I would want it on my perfect sandwich. I'm gonna stay away from tomatoes. They tend to be pretty slippery. And I also feel like they're a crutch. I feel like this is something you lean on if you're like, ah, I'm just putting cold cuts on this bread. I need something on there. Avocado, another crutch I think on sandwiches. This is something that's going to add a bit of moisture, some, some softness, a lot of fat, and designate the sandwich California style. Virtually every fried chicken sandwich is enhanced with pickles. If you don't want pickles on your sandwich, that is your right, but 
They are a wonderful accompaniment to fried chicken, especially spicy fried chicken, because they're a hit of acid, they're a little bit more crunch, they just play really nice with all the flavors, particularly bread and butter. Sweet pickles, these have a lot of sugar in them, so they're gonna add a nice sort of layer of sweetness to the whole affair. So that's why I'm, I'm definitely gonna go pickles. Jalapeno peppers, wholly unnecessary. All the heat that we need is gonna be coming from the spice mixture that we're gonna brush on the chicken after the fact. All in all, it's super classic to put just pickles and mayo on a fried chicken sandwich and nothing else. And that's pretty much the direction that I'm headed. Here's the only topping I'm using for my fried chicken sandwich. So now it's time to deep fry, but with what? Oil. So we're deep frying because that is the way to get things the crispiest on this planet. Direct contact with oil is what makes them crisp. This is an opportunity to add a little bit of flavor, not too much. So first up we have unrefined coconut oil. This is a wholly inappropriate option for deep frying. First off, because unrefined coconut oil has a smoke point around 280 degrees Fahrenheit. We're gonna be exceeding that by nearly 100 degrees. So you're gonna end up with a big smoking pot of acrid oil. That's not the direction we wanna go in. Next up, peanut oil. This is my favorite way to go. I feel like foods fry up a little browner, a little crispier, and there's no distinct peanut flavor, but it does impart like just a, a, a richer, better flavor. It's just the best frying oil, unless of course you have a deathly peanut allergy. Next up we have lard, and especially for Nashville hot chicken, this is the fat of choice. You can't do much better for just pure, unctuous, rich, savory flavor. I mean, you're deep frying in pork fat, pure pork fat. It's, it's, it's amazing. Next up we have schmaltz. I wouldn't deep fry in this. This is chicken fat dripping, so it is completely delicious, but I'm guessing if you heated this past 300 degrees Fahrenheit, it would start smoking because there's so much particulate in it. I mean, look at it. You can't even see through it. I believe the smoke point for extra virgin olive oil is 410 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not gonna smoke on us. It's got a very strong, olive oil flavor. And it's gonna make your fried food taste like that too. Just not ideal for, for fried chicken. And it's expensive. How much was this, 25 bucks? And this isn't even enough. And then we got uh, pure vegetable oil. This is a very fine option. It is a little less flavorful than the peanut. It doesn't brown quite as well as the peanut, but it's an excellent deep frying oil. This and canola, any neutral flavored oil like those. Today, I'm gonna do something a little wild. I'm gonna do a mixture of peanut oil and lard. So we can get a lot of that lard flavor and still get the great frying properties of peanut oil by combining the two. So to deep fry chicken, you don't need a deep fryer. That's great if you have one, but a Dutch oven with a candy thermometer will do just fine. I'm gonna start with the lard. It's over 3000 calories in this little tub. To that lard, I'm going to add peanut oil. So I'm gonna get some of the great characteristics of both. The more oil you have, the less it's gonna cool off when you add the chicken. The target temperature that we're shooting for in this pot is 375. You wanna grab the chicken by its thinnest point so you lose the least amount of breading. You wanna gently drop it in and drop it away from you. So if there's any splash, it's not coming at you. I'm looking for a deep golden brown crust. There we go, come on. Oh, already, already looking crispy. Oh yeah, buddy. That's looking right. Here we go, gently in and away. Yeah, the spray that just shot off this thing, it's like a sea wolf. And so what we have here are double breaded, ultra crispy chicken breasts, golden brown, ready for the spice element. One decision that I'm firm on is I want this to be really spicy. And I think there's no better way to do that than Nashville hot chicken style. The only real difference between fried chicken and Nashville hot chicken is after it's been cooked, it's brushed with a hot fat spice mixture. So that's what we're gonna do right now. We're starting with light brown sugar, paprika. This looks like it's the smoked variety, which is gonna be interesting. Garlic powder, cayenne pepper. This stuff is hot. We have this nice spice and sugar mixture, mostly spice. Now, the fun part, we're going to ladle some of our wonderful lard and oil mixture, which is still super duper hot, right over top. Got that going, let's whisk that together. <laughs> the hot oil not only toasts the spices, I believe if it's hot, less of it's going to be absorbed into the crust. I think it's gonna help the crust stay crisp, I think. Let's make this chicken angry. Just brush that hot fat spice mixture right over top. Look how angry that looks, oh my. This is the kind of chicken that makes you like panic sweat, you know? Like, oh I made a mistake. 
All right, chicken's ready for my chicken sandwich. All right, we got all of our pieces. Now let's put them together. First, bun, duh. Grab our crispy chicken. Nice. I like that it's overlap. Honestly, I like that. I'm gonna hit this guy the mayo. Don't be shy. I'll throw some pickles down on the chicken itself, just because that's what I'm gonna do. Come here, you crazy diamond. My spicy fried chicken sandwich. It's like theatrical, it's 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 dramatic. I wanna get a little of everything, but first I have to eat through this nubbin. Mmm. Mmm. It is flavorful, it is tender, it is spicy. It is crispy on the outside. The mayo brings a nice sort of like creamy balance to it. Pickles are nice. The brioche, I take it back. That was that's great. It's rich, it's buttery, it's sweet, and it's such a nice counterpart. Wow, I'm pro brioche when it comes to spicy chicken sandwiches. Here I am, eating my words, <laughs> literally. Everybody's working together nicely here, even the bun, which I was incredulous about at best. This is symphonic. We definitely have some cooking lessons to take away from this, but my biggest one is flexibility. You need to be able to work with what you got, you need to be able to pivot, so that if things don't go quite your way, it still turns out awesome. These are my decisions, this is how I make my spicy fried chicken sandwich. How do you make yours? That's up to you. Come here. Oh, this is the most embarrassing thing in my professional career. We'll make sure we cut all this out. No, leave it in. Rolling. Leave it in. 